Next, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce Dr. Yubomer Litsuk, who will cover Canadian perspective. Good afternoon. I won't uh, try to repeat many of the important insights that I've heard this morning and this afternoon from other panelists. Instead, I'm going to try to present a commentary that relates to my own personal experiences as a Canadian of Ukrainian heritage, growing up through this period when the question of Ukraine as a state, Ukraine in Europe, Ukraine in NATO, has evolved and obviously has met some hurdles. When I was a boy, born in Kingston, Ontario, there was no Ukraine, at least no Ukraine in the sense of an internationally recognized state by that name. So all through my junior high school years and university years, when I explained to others that I was a Ukrainian Canadian, they would very often say to me, oh, a little Russian, a Russian. Where is Ukraine? There was no Ukraine in the atlases of the world. And yet, through that same period in the 1950s and 1960s and into the 1970s and beyond, in the Cold War that you've heard referenced more than once, my firm belief, and I think the belief of many of you, was that the West supported the idea of Ukraine's independence, that the West opposed to Soviet power, opposed to the Soviet Empire and its client states and the Warsaw Pact, wanted a free Ukraine. It wasn't really until the 1970s and early 1980s when I began doing archival research in the official repositories of the British government, the US government, and of the Canadian government, the ABC powers as I call them, America, Britain, and Canada, that I began to discern a different pattern from what I'd been led to believe. It became very clear to me, in fact, that the ABC powers, the West, never felt they needed nor wanted a free Ukraine. This was a tremendous shock. It was contrary to everything my parents had told me, everything my community had told me, everything I'd been raised to believe in the sort of general media of the time. I discovered with colleagues that, for example, the British government had ample intelligence about the nature and consequences of the Great Famine of 1932-33, what we now call the Holodomor, and yet preferred not to release that information publicly at the time for fear of, quote-unquote, offending all great Russians. I began reading documentation that showed British, Canadian, and American attitudes toward Ukrainians were very racist and discriminatory. To just give you two examples from documents generated just before the Second World War by some of the finest minds, frankly, in the British Empire about Ukraine and who Ukrainians, many of you, are. Let me define who a Ukrainian is according to British intelligence, if I can call it that. Quote, Ukrainians are of artificial origin without any real claim to race distinction and are, in fact, I like this part, a collection of magnificent crossbred scallywags. <laughs> Another British Foreign Service officer, no doubt responding to the repeated requests for information and for uh, support generated by Ukrainians in the diaspora, wrote this about how one deals with Ukrainians that one encounters in the immigration. Quote, to revert to the question of our contact with Ukrainians, I think we must bear in mind that most, even of the Ukrainian leaders are, A, only just emerging from the status of semi-intellectual, and B, have a decidedly oriental kink in their brains. <laughs> this probably explains the eastern orientation of the current president. <laughs> what became clear to me as I was reading these early Cold War documents, as I've already said, 
is that the Anglo-American world, the Western powers, never felt they needed a free Ukraine. So, of course, when a free Ukraine emerged on the maps of Europe in 1991 with the exfoliation of the conglomeration that was the Soviet Empire, and suddenly there was a place called Ukraine on the maps of the world, there were both positive and negative consequences. On the positive side, here I was, 38 years old, and there finally was an atlas that I could buy, the Hammond Atlas, I still remember it, published in 1992, that had a two-page spread showing Ukraine, a place on the maps of the world. But the recognition that was given to this new Ukrainian state was conditional. And in fact, I described it at the time as being emasculatory. Ukraine was going to be recognized by the world, and indeed Canada was the first Western country to recognize the independence of Ukraine on the 2nd of December 1991, followed several weeks later by the United Kingdom and the United States. But it was recognized with conditions. And one of the most important of those conditions, and there were several, respect for human rights and national minorities, taking on its fair share of the Soviet debt, but not, of course, of the Soviet assets. But the most important one was giving up its nuclear weapons. And at the time, and in fact, on the 15th of November 1991, in Canada's national newspaper, the Globe and Mail, I wrote an article that was titled, Moderation and Neutrality, but Hang On to the Nuclear Arms, in which I argued, I think not very well because the Ukrainians didn't listen to me, that Ukrainians should hold on to their tactical and nuclear weapons and so ensure their security. Going back now is probably, as was pointed out earlier, impossible. But at the time, if they had done that, perhaps we'd be in a very different situation now. The emasculation, by the way, continues. Uh, today, Ukraine is at the forefront of demilitarization. And this is pitched as a good thing because old munitions, uh, surplus weapons are being dismantled. Ukraine supposedly doesn't need them. Ukraine does not need nuclear weapons, tactical or otherwise. And yet in a world where countries like Pakistan, India, Israel, and North Korea have nuclear weapons, what makes ukes with nukes so scary? <laughs> Beats me. Now, when NATO was created, and we're talking about NATO, Canada, and Ukraine in 1949, it was created as what? It was created as a collective military defense system. It wasn't about civilization, it wasn't about culture, it wasn't about becoming good Europeans. It was collective military defense, security from aggression. And I think core to Ukraine's desire to be part of NATO is that sense that it requires security from aggression, or at least did. When it was formed in 1949, and the first Secretary General, Lord Hastings Ismay, uh, was asked, what's the purpose of NATO? He gave a very famous response. And his response in 1952, purpose of NATO is, quote, to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. <laughs> now, notice, please, that nothing was said about little Russians. We weren't going to be kept out, then nothing was said about bringing us in. I want you to keep that quotation in mind. When enlargement takes place, post-Soviet, 1991, of course, all of us were hopeful. And yet all Ukraine got was not membership in the Partnership for War, which is what NATO is, a Partnership for War. You're attacked, we'll come to your defense. That's a Partnership for War. What did Ukraine get in February of 1994? Membership in a Partnership for Peace. Sounds nice. And of course, subsequently, by the time they became 44 years old in July 9th, 1997, my birthday actually, the Charter on a Distinctive Partnership was announced, which in, in a sense provided some more security for Ukraine. But I notice that almost all of the countries that joined Partnership for Peace very soon left it. By March of 1999, Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary had moved into NATO. By March of 2004, the three Baltic states, Slovenia, Slovakia, Bulgaria, and Romania, had moved into NATO. And by April of 2009, Albania and Croatia joined NATO, but not Ukraine. 
At the very same time, through the same period of the late 1990s and 2000, early to part of the 21st century, of course, Mr. Putin had come to power and had begun a very assertive and frankly remarkable risk-taking policy that reasserted Russian dominance. Now, he wasn't the first to use the term near abroad. As far as I could tell, that term was first used in the early 90s, 1992 or so. But by February of 2001, President Putin was talking about a sphere of influence of the Russian Federation. By April of 2005, as many of you will recall, in his uh, State of the Nation speech, he described the collapse of the Soviet Union as, quote, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And when he was recently reelected again, obviously, he began reasserting the policy of Russian dominance in East Central Europe and Eurasia. All of this, of course, happening against the background of American distraction following 9-11, the war in Iran, the war in Afghanistan, tensions in the near and Middle East. That same period, May 2007, for example, Estonia faces a cyber attack and is shut down as a state. In August 2008, it was already been mentioned, the Russian-Georgian War, which demonstrated, I think, U.S. and NATO weakness and was, in a sense, a lesson for Ukraine. And, of course, the January 2009 flexing of the Russian Federation's energy muscles. In part, this was accomplished by, frankly, a very remarkable man, Vladimir Putin. Where is Ukraine's Putin? Where are our leaders? Putin established very close ties to key European states. His relationship with Schroeder until 2005 made sure that Germany was very mild in its support of the Orange Revolution and, in fact, opposed the inclusion of Ukraine and Georgia and NATO. Of course, Mr. Schroeder was rewarded with a position with Gazprom, uh, which continues uh, to benefit the Russian Federation. Putin also had a very strong relationship with French President Chirac, who opposed, although it failed, the entry of the Baltic states into NATO, and even Mr. Berscoloni in Italy enjoyed the support of Mr. Putin. All of these things had, I think, an impact on the United States. And in fact, by March of 2009, a U.S. bipartisan committee, the Hegel Hart Commission, recommended that the new American administration reset the relationship with the Russian Federation, withdraw its support from NATO membership for Ukraine and Georgia, and recommended that neither of those countries are, in fact, ready for NATO membership. Now, true, at the same time, there are some positive developments. There was a new declaration to complement the Charter on a Distinctive Partnership, and Canada and Ukraine, in September of 2009, signed a roadmap supporting Ukraine's continuing aspirations for NATO membership. But then again, it all went south. As you've heard just a moment ago, early in 2010, Pre President Yanukovych said that Ukraine would remain, at best, a neutral, non-aligned state, and public opinion in Ukraine, as was also mentioned, remains conflicted. The problem seems to be in part internal, as was also emphasized, but I call to mind the recent speech given in Kiev at the Kiev Mohila Academy by uh, the NATO Secretary General Rasmussen in the 21st of August 2011, just about a year ago. In that speech, he said, quote, we all know that Ukraine today is determined to integrate fully into the European family of nations, which is where it clearly belongs. Very good, Ukraine and Europe. Yet, he also said, the current Ukrainian government has declared that European integration is its top priority, and it believes that a constructed cooperation with NATO, rather than a drive towards membership, can best support that aim. And then Rasmussen went on to say, I want to make it very clear that we in NATO fully respect that decision. Very much in the spirit of Taras Shevchenko, I somehow doubt that, we recognize the sovereign right of each nation to freely choose its security arrangements. So unlike some of the previous speakers, I would argue that the door to NATO membership, at this time at least, is closed, if not yet locked. Canada officially had nothing to say on this subject and has said nothing much since September of 2009. So where are we? Well, unlike previous speakers, I'm going to make a prediction about when Ukraine will enter Europe and perhaps at the same time NATO. I'm going to conclude my presentation by, saying, by recalling to you a story that I think most of you are familiar with, the story of Moses leading his people out of Egyptian bondage. 
And you'll recall that when Moses led the Israelites into the desert, moving towards the promised land, they spent the next four decades, 40 years, wandering through the desert. Now, I know, ladies, that he was a man and he wasn't going to ask for directions. <laughs> but surely, 40 years is not the time it takes to walk, to walk from Egypt to today's Israel, Palestine, whatever you like, the, the Holy Land, let's call it something new. 40 years. And even Moses, the great leader, didn't get to that promised land. He saw it from the mountain. All of the people who had left Egyptian bondage died en route. Why? Well, the good book tells us why. Because people who have inherited a slave mentality cannot build a free society. So Moses led his people through the desert, around and around, until everyone who had been in Egypt had passed away. He himself knew that there would be a promised land. He could see it, but even he couldn't get there. So as I said, when I was a boy 58 years ago, there was no free Ukraine. There was no Ukraine. Finally, a map of Ukraine came on to the political map of the world. Ukraine's status has changed. It's come forward. It's gone back. I predict that there will be a free Ukraine. I will tell you exactly when it will happen. Hopefully most of us won't be around to see with it right or wrong. <laughs> 1991 plus 40 is 2031. I will be 78 by then. Probably I will be personally running out of time, or maybe I will have run out of it entirely. Needless to say, I'm fairly sure that by 2031, one of us perhaps in this room or more will be able to say that Ukraine is free free at last. I certainly hope so. And as for a prescription for NATO, you'll remember the 1952 prescription to keep the Russians out, the Germans down, and the Americans in. I would like to add my own prescription for NATO in the 21st century. The prescription for NATO in the 21st century should be to keep the Americans in, the Russians too, which will keep the Germans down and take care of the Ukrainians too. Thank you very much.